We've got plenty of time. Okay. Antichrist wars. We've, we've been under the impression for a long time, and I've been trying to work through in my own mind how, how true it is, that when Antichrist comes, he's going to be, appear to be a man of peace for a long time. And he's going to, he comes out on the white horse, he's got a bow with no arrows. We, we, we know the, the whole way it's described. He comes in as a man of peace and deceives people. That may be true. He, he may come, come that way, but almost immediately he becomes warlike. He becomes warlike. And the first three and a half years of the 70th week are, are, are Antichrist's wars, particularly against the three kingdoms. So let's look at that now. And let's read a little bit of a scripture here from Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. These are all scripture, scriptures we have read before, but we'll read them again because we want the context. And this is the word of God. Verse, chapter 13, verse 1. John says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. By the way, who's the dragon? Satan himself. Satan himself gave him his power, his seat, and his authority. It all came from Satan. And I saw one of his heads as it, as it were wounded to death, as his, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, and, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So there's a dual worship that goes on at this time. People worship Satan directly and they worship the man he's put in charge. That We often miss that when we talk about this, but there's a dual worship going on. So let's talk about that. The world says, who is like him? Who is able to make war with him? No one, no one can touch this guy. All the world wondered after the beast. And when they wondered about him, that was like they marveled at him. They, they were amazed at him. Because he was a warrior. He, well, he will be a warrior. Uh, he'll be a fighter. He'll be all-powerful. It looks like no one can defeat him. Like no one can touch him. Like no one can touch him. Uh, he'll be invincible in, in war, in battle. Uh, you may go up against him and you may, you may fight and you may be strong, but eventually he's going to take you down and he will be immortal because he will receive a deadly wound and he will get it healed or he will heal it himself and he will literally, as far as the world can tell, raise himself from the dead, mimicking what Christ did in the resurrection. You say, is it a real resurrection? We're going to spend time on that when we get to it. I will answer that now. Because um, frankly, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's going to be real or not. And I've, I'll give you both positions on it. You can make your own mind up. So that's what it'll be like. And we, here's this guy. Who and what I am because you need me. You need me to save you. Who possibly can? Do you like the real I'm the real I'm the real The world loves a guy like that. The world loves a guy like that. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people that like Trump like him for the same same reason. They think you can't beat him, you can't touch him, you can't you can't you can't overcome him. We don't want that. We don't need that. They say you're anti-Trump. No, I'm not. I, I'll vote for him if he runs if, he, if he's the nominee. But that's but, but the point is we fall into this as human beings. We fall into this danger of of picking out a hero and then just following him like like sheep. And we got to be careful about that as believers. Now Daniel chapter eleven. This chapter, when we covered it in the book of Daniel, has all the main details of Antichrist's wars. They're all there. We studied this when we covered that book. Daniel chapter 11. 
In Daniel chapter 11, we saw Alexander the Great as he was coming to the earth. When he came to the earth, came to the earth. When he was on the earth, he didn't come to the earth. He was born here. Okay, <laughs> said that wrong. When Daniel, Alexander the Great became the became the emperor of the world, uh, and then his generals that followed him, and those four empires that came out of Alexander's reign, uh, their empires, the Seleucid Empire particularly, we were interested in. And all this was accurate history in advance. Just like the Lord Jesus said, Behold, I have told you before. Behold, I have told you before. So all of this is stuff that we, we as believers knew in advance. If we'd lived in, in Daniel's time, we would have known it in advance. We still know many things in advance. The first 30 verses of Daniel chapter 11 covered the rule of, of, of Antiochus Epiphanes. He was the one that was the Seleucid ruler over all of the area of Palestine and, and Egypt and up into there. And uh, he was the one that uh, constantly battled between the, the Syrians and the Egyptians. Ptolemy was in the southern kingdom. Excuse me. Ptolemy had Egypt. Uh, Antiochus had Syria and, and all of Palestine. They were constantly battling with each other. He had the king of the north, the king of the south. And all of that, then he's the one that, after conquering Egypt, he went back up into Palestine, into Jerusalem, into Israel, and he, he sacrificed that pig on the altar and turned the temple of God into a temple of Jerusalem, a, a temple of Jupiter. And that was the, the, the abomination of desolation, where the temple was desolated because it was given over to the worship of another god, of a false god. Well, that, he was a bad guy, we understand that. Those first 30 verses were about him. But in verse 31, things change and it becomes very prophetic. And just as a quick review on this, here's what happens. In verse 31 we read, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. That's what he did. When he sacrificed the pig on the altar, brought in an idol of Jupiter and put it in the Holy of Holies. Put it in the Holy of Holies. That was a bad thing. This is where we get the idea. Now, I'm about, about to review something with you. We In prophecy, we have this concept of near and far. Near and far. There's a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment, very commonly. A near fulfillment. A far fulfillment. A near fulfillment would be it's going to happen very soon. Maybe in our lifetime we'll see it happen. But there's another fulfillment coming later on that's a far fulfillment that may be a thousand years from now, and like in our time. And that'll, and that'll come later. Near fulfillment, far fulfillment. That was the near fulfillment. When, when he went into the temple, sacrificed a sow on the altar, brought in the idol of the image of Jupiter, and made it a temple of Jupiter. That was the near fulfillment. Later on, we have a far fulfillment. How do we know that? We know it because of this. Matthew 24, verse 15, is one of the places where we read this, and I'll just read it to you now. The Lord Jesus says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Oh, we're supposed to catch on to something here. We're supposed to understand something. There was a near fulfillment with Antiochus, but he says it's still going to come again. There's going to be another time where it's also going to happen one more time. And if you, as you read this, understand it because it hasn't happened yet. So there was a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. It's the far fulfillment that we think we're going to see. We expect to see. Moving on. Daniel chapter 11. Verses 40 through 45 detail the future wars that, ant that, that Antichrist wars are all about. What time is it? i got five more minutes, four more minutes. They detail the future wars this lesson is all about. And uh, I can't help but speculate on, on the way this whole thing in Israel, with, with Israel and Hamas and Hezbollah all could work out right now. We're looking at a time now when you've got the king of the north, that could be Iraq and Syria, easily. Egypt down in the south, Iraq and Syria in the north, coming down and, and coming into Israel from two fronts. And they're talking about two fronts all the time on, on the news right now. Israel having to fight on two fronts, and that, and that being the very case that we're looking at, and Iran coming, Iran coming from the east. I'm always turned around. Iran coming from the east. 
and maybe a third front like that, and all of that happening in, in on the news with us to watch it, and Israel being thrown back on its heels, saying We're, we can't fight on two or three fronts like this. Our soldiers are being decimated. That's why I've been fearful for them going into Hamas, into into Gaza, because they'll lose so many people in a in a in, a, in an action like that, going door to door, building to building. They'll lose so many soldiers that they won't be able to fight on the other fronts. It's it's concerned me a lot. But what if one man were to come in and say, I'm going to come in and I'm going to end this all now and I'm going to make it all stop? That would be Antichrist. This could be that time. I'm, I'm not saying it is. Don't get me wrong. But you can see how easily this could, easily this could come about. Daniel chapter 11 covers verses 40 to 45. We did this in the book of Daniel when we went through it just recently. But this details all the future wars that this lesson, the whole lesson is all about, Antichrist's wars. We're going to read these these five verses and one more. Daniel eleven forty to forty five, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him. Big pincer move here, like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall also enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make many away. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace. When we get to the headquarters of Antichrist, this is it right here. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now there's really we have a chapter break here, but there really it really was artificial. It's not a not it wasn't a good chapter break. There, that's not part of the Bible. The chapter breaks aren't the, they were added in the middle 1500s. But here's here's going on one more verse, and at that time, so it's still in that context, right? And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even unto that same time. And at that time thy people shall be, del- be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So that's part of the context there. Very, well, we're going to talk about this in some detail now. So overview. Let's just look at this as an overview of the, of the situation. Because Antichrist now has confirmed the covenant with many, all right, the king of the north and the king of the south will attack him. I have to I have to guess a little bit into this now what nations that would be if it's nations at all and I think it is primarily but not entirely and I'll tell you what I mean by that because because Hamas is an enemy right of, of Israel but it's not a nation it doesn't have borders in a country uh, it's it's a movement so because of confirming the covenant though and favor and in doing that favoring the Jews favoring the Jews the king of the north that's likely going to be Assyria, excuse me, that's likely going to be Syria and Turkey. Turkey's getting, getting big into, into, into being Muslim again, right? Uh, we mentioned this last week, I'll mention it again. Back in the 1920s, the Turkish leader, Kemal Ataturk, took Turkey and they had basically a revolution and made it a secular nation. It had been the seat of the Ottoman Empire who we fought against in the, in the First World War. And the Ottoman Empire had been a, had been a, a big, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on this, but had, it been a, had been a big detail that extended all the way down into Egypt. The Ottoman Empire was taken away. Turkey became a secular nation. Erdogan, the pre- current president of Turkey, wants to take it back to being a majorly Muslim nation. And uh, he's very, very vehement about it. He's, he he rabble rouses a lot about this. So keep that in mind. I think that probably the King of the North is going to be a, a confederation of Turkey and Syria. But that's just my own, my own guessing at this, all right? The Bible didn't say that. 
But because of the confirming of the covenant, the king of the north and the king of the south will attack him. Given today's situation, that could easily be, and I'm not saying that it is, but it could easily be uh, a confederation of... Uh, we, we hear the term Iranian proxies all the time now, and that's probably fine. But it could be Hamas, and maybe maybe Egypt, and maybe Libya could be pulled into that. And they could all be coming up, too, as part of the King of the South. Primarily, the King of the South is Egypt, when we talk, talk about things prophetically. And the King of the North is Syria, prophetically. But looking at the current situation, just, just uh, speculating a little bit, could involve those other parties, too, those other players. So just keep that kind of in your head as, to make it more real for you. So the king of the north and the king of the south will attack Antichrist. Say, so why are they attacking him? I thought he was in charge of all this. Not yet. Not yet. In the beginning, this is, this is hard to get your head around sometimes. In the beginning, he will be in opposition to this global government and this, glo- this big global movement of woke- wokeism and, and all the other things. Given our current situation, this is how we would understand it. He comes in opposition. And he confirms the covenant with Jews. He favors Israel. Wow, that's different. Number two, he will defeat those kings, king of the north, king of the south, and then continue his attempt to take control of the entire Middle East. He's going to bring it all under his control. So he defeats three kings. We mentioned two, and maybe we can make three out of one of those. We don't know exactly how that will fall out, but we'll note when it happens. And he wants to take control of the entire Middle East at that point. His goals are his personal goals, and we get this from the scripture, to show his invincibility in war. You can't beat me. You can't defeat me. I am invincible. To show, to take control of greater Israel, and I'll show you on a map what I mean by greater Israel. We know what the map of Israel looks like today. That is far less than what God intends for Israel. The land given, where God says, the land is mine and I give you and he names and he gives the boundaries and the borders is much greater than what we see now in Israel today. To set up a false end time battle. Now this is a measure of deceit here. This is a major a major I'm saying major and I mean major a measure of deceit. Because the Jews at that time will say, Ooh, this is the Gog Magog War. This now I don't believe it is. The Gog Magog War is going to happen in the book of Revelation in chapter 21 when at, at the end time after the thousand years of the millennial reign. I believe that's the Gog Magog War. But the Jews will say, this is the Gog Magog War happening. And Christians who are uninformed at that time, not this class, <laughs> okay, will say, oh, this must be Armageddon. This must be Armageddon. There's, there's going to be a lot of deceit going on at this time, and we know that this time is characterized by deceit. So all of that will be happening at one time. Here's a map I want you to be aware of. This is what we call, for the lack of a better term, Greater Israel. Given to the Jews over all the land to the river of Egypt. You say, I thought that belonged to Egypt. It does. But but not as far in God's economy. It does not. Today it is. All the way down to Somalia, Eritrea, North Africa, that's uh, Ethiopia, that's all down there. And then all the way up here to Turkey, to the river Euphrates River, and, and cutting right, right across to what we call Saudi Arabia today, all of that is land that was given by God to Abraham to be part of greater Israel. They don't have that now. They've never had that in, in, in their physical possession, but they will have, and it's Antichrist's goal that it should belong to him. He knows the boundaries, and he wants it for himself. These are part of his goals. Uh, so that's a big part, big swash of land, isn't it? <laughs> when we think of Israel, we normally yes, think right. of this it's little one tenth, now. What? one tenth of the land. One, one tenth, 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 one tenth is what they've got. Yeah, what you get now is one tenth of the land. I didn't ever figure it out. Perfect. No, no, no I read it about. <laughs> you did. Yeah, one tenth. I study because I am from Egypt. <laughs> yeah, I like to know Israel and Egypt. We have an actual Egyptian in there. This is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> From Luxor, originally, and then born, raised in Cairo, you said. Wonderful. Yes, Rob? They were supposed to have more from the Balfour Declaration, but then between the time that was issued in 1917 and the time they got their land, they already carved some away. In fact, I think uh, it was born and got their statehood a year before Israel got their land. So yeah. The, the globalists or whatever uh, carved it up. 
I'm off, I almost went off into a subject. Sorry. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> thanks, Rob. <laughs> Got me thinking about something. So let's go back to our, our old our old graphic we had from global, from the global government lesson. So we talked about this at the time, and we'll talk about it briefly here. Uh, we talked about the, the phase one, which is before the seven years of Daniel's 70th week. That's, that's this block here. <laughs> Leading up to that, we have to have the formation of the ten, ten kings. We covered that in pretty good detail. That could take years. It could take just a few hours. I don't, I don't try and make any speculation on that, on that, except I tend to go for, in my mind, it'll be a short time, but we don't know. But let's look at the, the seven-year portion here. Let's talk about that a little bit. The seven, the seven year portion, I have, I have broken down into two, into two periods of time. And we're pretty familiar with why it's broken down into these two periods of time. It's initiated in the beginning by Antichrist confirming the covenant with many, that is with the Jewish nation. And as I believe, it'll be, it'll be reinstituting the Mosaic sacrificial system. We've talked about that. In the middle of that seven year period, we have the abomination of desolation where Antichrist goes into the temple and basically desolates it, right? He, be, he announces that he is Almighty God, he is the Eternal, and, and he is the one that's to be worshipped. So the temple is now desolated. That is the abomination of desolation. That's what that term means. It's not somebody's title, it's just what he, what he accomplishes. And then third, we come to the end, and actually I put it out a few more, a few more weeks into that 30-day year, 30 30 period after the seven years ends, the Battle of Armageddon. So we see these three major events, and it's broken down in the seven years into two periods of time. The f- second phase, remember the first phase was when the first ten kings came be- come together. This, by the way, this is stuff we know from the Bible. We're not speculating on this. This is, this is what's going to happen. In this first period, this phase two will be Antichrist's wars. Most of that time, he'll be working. He'll be he'll be fighting against the three kings and bringing them into submission. Uh, there will be a lot of war, just like there is today in, in Hamas and Israel. But it'll be expanded, and it'll be Antichrist fighting, apparently on behalf of the Jewish nation. At the midpoint of that. Antichrist will have run, will have won, and people will be saying, "Who is like the beast?" This is from Revelation, right? Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And the, and the false prophet that that accompanies him at that time will say, "Let's make an image of him, and everybody will worship his image and and worship him." And and his he's empowered. The scriptures say by Satan, people will worship Satan, and they'll worship the beast himself, the Antichrist himself. That all begins at the midpoint. Also at the midpoint, the Bible says. That that's when the great tribulation begins, because now, now the mask has come off. Now he said, "I'm God, I'm God, and you're going to you're going to step in, get in line, and you're going to obey me, or else." And he will go against Christians that existed at that time, Christians who are still living, and he'll go against the nation of Israel that doesn't follow him. That part of the nation of Israel that doesn't follow him. Now most of it will. But there'll be, there'll be holdouts, just like there were the Maccabees. There'll be holdouts that won't worship him. And they'll be driven, in, they'll be driven into the, the southern Jordan, and they'll be living in the rocks and the caves and all that. Those are valleys down there in southern Jordan. He won't be able to get to them. They'll be protected for 1,260 days. But there'll be great tribulation. Now, the second phase then will be that phase where he, where he asserts his authority then. And he'll go after them with, with and, and this will be a time of tribulation, it'll be a time of trouble. It's the time the Bible calls Jacob's trouble. So two, he has two, two enemies at that time. He has national Israel, and he has those believers in Jesus Christ who will be persecuted, the Bible says, for his name. Now, if you're Jewish, you're not being persecuted for the name of Christ, right? So there's a difference there. But they'll be persecuted for his name. That's what's going on at this time. And you can, it's pretty easy to see it when you see it graphically like this, but uh, I think sometimes we get buried in all the text because there's so much to cover. And, and I will say this, having been to Bible college, you know, they never explained it this well. I, I, I don't mean that. Okay, that sounds like I'm doing a good job. I don't mean to say I'm, I'm doing a great job, you're, you're, you're so blessed. It's not like that other kind of thing. 
But I remember being in Bible school wondering about this stuff, and they just never really got into any depth on it. And and I really always wish they had. They gave us J. Dwight Pentecost's book, Things to Come, and said, read that. And we all took it home, and we all read it, and said, said how cool. But we didn't really understand it, right? We just believed things because people told us this. And it's so much better to really get into the scriptures on this. Hope I didn't come off wrong on that. So beginning at the mid... Oh, look what happened here. Okay, I, I, I made an edit on my PowerPoint this morning, and it's not showing up. This should say phase three. This should say phase three. So be, just pretend it says phase three, and it, even if it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> beginning then at the midpoint, in phase three, we have the time of Jacob's trouble and the great tribulation ensuing, where, where Antichrist goes against his enemies who will not worship him as God. Also... This is the time when we begin Antichrist's authority over the nations. He is given authority for only 42 months. That number is, is a hard number. It's in the Bible. 42 months, three and a half years, 1,260 days, however you want to phrase it. Those are all Bible ways of looking at it. Uh, that's, how, that's how long he's got to, got to work. And uh, even that is very limited because once the wrath of God begins to fall, and it hasn't yet... Once the wrath of God begins to fall, he's severely crippled. He's almost frozen in place. Many Bible teachers, including John MacArthur, who I like to read, and he really surprised me on this, that he, that he took this position, and I liked it, but uh, see a strict correlation between the events of Matthew 24, that is the Olivet Discourse, and the events of Revelation chapter 6. Many other Bible teachers say, oh, no, no, they can't be the same. And there's obvious reasons for that that, that I'll show you. Uh, and you'll say, oh, you're just, that's just because you believe what you believe about the rapture. No, it's just because, uh, because I think that's what it teaches. But MacArthur says that the events of Matthew 24 correlate closely with the events of Revelation chapter 6. Let me show you this. Now, I'm going to see if I can keep my recorder running here. And also, I hope my Bible. I hope the recorder is still running, because this today. Today, this is my Bible. I meant to bring a paper Bible and forgot. My wife is saying to herself, "I told you you should read a paper Bible, not use that old iPad." <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm in trouble all the time, and probably more now. So, uh, in Matthew chapter 24. And this, you might want to look in your Bibles this time. I, mean, I encourage you to look in your Bibles as I do this, because we'll just take the time and flip back and forth. I won't, but you will. I don't have a paper Bible up here. So in Matthew chapter 24, verse 5, here's what we read. The Lord Jesus says, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. There's deceit, right? And how many will he deceive? Oh, just a couple of people. Nobody's going to fall for that. No. He says, I'll deceive. Many will be deceived. There will be many false Christs, many little antichrists running around, phonies. Compare that with Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 2. And I will do that. And in Revelation, and this is, it's in Revelation chapter 6 that we see these seals being opened on that scroll in heaven. Where, there, where John says, I saw a scroll with seven seals on it, and, and I heard people, someone say, who is worthy to open this scroll? And no one answered. There was no one worthy to open the scroll, to break the seals, for whatever purpose that is. I will, maybe we'll talk about that someday. I have my own opinions. But no one was worthy to open the seals. And finally one said, that a lamb appeared, a lamb appeared, that was the Lord Jesus, and some and they said he is worthy to open the he is worthy to open the seals. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation has a double meaning in its name. It is the revealing of Jesus Christ, showing us who he is. There's more about Jesus Christ in the Revelation than there is in the Gospels, in the sense that what what we're told about him, his office and his person. Then we, it's also a revelation by Jesus Christ of all the things that are going to happen. So it's the revealing of Jesus Christ, and it's Jesus Christ revealing to us all the things that are going to come on the earth. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, that book of the Bible, has a double meaning in its name. Well, in verse 2 of Revelation chapter 6, here's the corresponding to the false Christ. 
And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given for given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So here's the man, here's the hero coming in on the white horse. Old commentators like Matthew Henry used to say, well, this is Jesus bringing the gospel to the world. But in fact, it's entirely different than that. Uh, commentators today are a lot smarter than they were 500 years ago. And we understand that that's, that's, that's Antichrist. He has the bow. He's got a crown that was given to him. It wasn't his by right. It was given to him. He had a bow. He didn't have arrows in it. He hadn't come on. As, he, hadn't been, he didn't come in as the warrior that he was about to become. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. And now he's a warrior. But he fooled everybody because he came in looking like he was just going to be a peaceful guy. So there's the correlation between Matthew 5, 24, 5, and Revelation 6, 2. That's the opening of the first seal. Pop, it's open. Next in Matthew 24, wars and rumors of wars. Verse 7, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. By the way, it is all these things. Not just one thing or another thing, but all these things. When we have the confluence of all these things, the wars, the rumors of wars, the false Christ, and all the other things they can name. When we see all these things come to pass, that's when the end's coming. You say, well, they're having wars here and they're having wars there. there. That must be fulfillment of prophecy. No, not until we see all of them come to pass at the same time. Verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, and we could go on there, but I won't. That corresponds to Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. The second seal, the red horse of war. Revelation chapter 6, verse 3 reads, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. In other words, pay, this is something for us to pay attention to. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So war will come upon the earth as it has never come upon the earth before. You say, boy, that was, that was brutal what Hamas did when they invaded Surat and, and those other little villages along the, the border of Gaza. They came in and you, you can, you've... You can go to hamas-massacres.com and see a lot of the video that uh, wasn't shown that they won't put on they won't allow on uh, social media and stuff like that about all the because these guys were wearing GoPros and they were they were proud of themselves. There's a there's an audio recording of one one Hamas uh, killer that that this called he calling his father in gaza while he's doing all this he says, dad dad i killed 10 jews with my bare hands are you proud of me I, and he's, he goes on and on talking about becoming a martyr for allah I tell you Just, why. Oh. Muhammad in Quran said if you kill Jew or uh, Christian you take the skull and not the door of the heaven and the end that as much you have heads you really know, you can better place and better uh, you, know, you take the skulls with you. you. Yeah, take the skull in you, whatever you kill, number one, and open the I head. didn't know that. This is in Quran. I study Quran. There's, there's some good insight. So, yeah. And I like yeah. six. Don't forget, seven G. Everybody has seven G version. In yeah. The this all Muslim. Look for Eternal the virgins, version. right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I stay all life like a yeah. virgin. Got the closet every minute. I don't know. But, but it is this Quran. As much. That's why he said, I killed 10. I killed I am going okay. to heaven with uh, 10. Uh, and he does say uh, that in his audio. In yeah. Quran. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So there's a, there's a lot going on here, and it, and it pertains to the world we're living in today. It'll be multiplied because it'll become worldwide. It won't be localized to that area. Number three, on, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. Uh, famine and, and pro trouble with the economy. Well, I, I read some of this already. Uh, it, d there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. Famines and pestilences are often a product of an economy going bad, right? When there's no food... They, sometimes people that sell food, you know, food online that lasts for 30 years and MREs and so forth, they'll say, well, if you, if you want to know when you'll need this, he says... 
when Kroger's out of food for three days, they'll be coming out of the cities, coming to your house, looking for anything they can scavenge. And that's true. It's about three days before the grocery stores run out of food, if there's no more, no more deliveries. And we don't ever think about that now because we say, I need bananas, I'll go down to Kroger, and there they are, right? Mm-hmm. And, but what if it wasn't, what if they weren't there, what would you do to feed your family? And so you'll, you'll do anything that it takes, pre- pretty much if you're most normal human beings. I don't say you'll go kill people to get it, but, but, but the general population will do anything it takes to get the food that you need to, to feed yourself and survive. This surviving survivalist attitude. And, and the world will be consumed by that at this time. Well, then we see that in Revelation chapter 6, verse 5, the opening of the third seal. And here, here's what we read. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast come and say, say, come and see. And I beheld, lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. They're weighing out the food. They're weighing out the money. Everything is precious now. When I used to buy rice in Vietnam, uh, you'd go you'd, you'd go to this guy. He was selling rice in the corner. He'd have a bag of rice. He'd have a scoop. He'd have a little scale like this. And, he, it, and he'd have a, a weight on one side and, and, and a bag on the other. And he'd scoop out some rice, scoop, 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 until the, until, the, until the scale went up. It was as soon as it would dip down, he'd take a little bit out when it was level. He'd wrap it in a piece of paper and sell it to you. And you knew you had the right amount. It was measured very carefully. This is the way, this is the way everybody bought their rice. Well, it'll, the world will be like that. Everything will be measured just to the nth degree because there's, there's going to be scarcity and a, and a dearth of the things that we need. Verse 6, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. That's an interesting turn of a phrase because your wheat and barley are being measured, but luxury goods, oil and wine... Are not, because there's going to be a group of people on the world in the world at that time that are going to, be, going to be living very well, and they're the ones that are falling in line with Antichrist. They'll have the luxuries. They'll have everything. They'll be the ones that when the when the two witnesses are killed, they'll be giving gifts to one another. It'll be like Christmas, right? So there'll be a luxury class at that time. Talk about class class distinctions here there'll be a luxury class at that time but most of the world will be living in complete poverty measuring things out bite by bite verse 21 of Matthew chapter 24 jumping ahead a little bit for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world no nor ever shall be and except those days should be shortened there should be no flesh saved so we'll, we'll stop on that in the middle of that verse because let's compare that now to Revelation chapter 6, tribulation and death. In Revelation chapter 6, we have in verse 7, and i got to do it on my phone here, Revelation chapter seven, six, verse 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see, and behold, there be, and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. One-fourth of the world will die during this period of time. Now, some environmentalists will say, yes, we're reducing the population. And, and they're serious about that. But it'll be a time of, it'll be a time of, of great great trouble because people will be dying you say this isn't this isn't the wrath of god no this is antichrist doing this he's brought this about the wrath of god when it falls will fall on him not on the not on the people of the world not on not on the believers and all that are living at this time number verse 22 matthew chapter 24 the next correlation very Jesus said, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So now we're dealing with the elect. And I will say just for the sake of brevity here, that means Christians. That means believers. In Revelation chapter nine, uh, chapter 6, verse 9, here's what we see. And when he had opened the fifth seal, how convenient we find this verse right here. 
And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Because now we're in the great tribulation, and now people are dying. And they're being martyred, and being, and they wind up under the, under the altar there in heaven. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? They want the wrath of God to fall. It hasn't fallen yet. You say, but I thought the whole, the whole seven years was the wrath of God. Well, they don't think so, <laughs> because it was them that were dying, right? God's wrath doesn't fall on his own people. It falls on, the, on his enemies. These are, these are God's people. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren sh- should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So there's more to die. There are more martyrs to, more martyrdoms to occur before it's all over with. And now, verse 29 of Matthew chapter 24. You say, you're going through this pretty fast. I know, I got one more minute of class. Verse 29. And immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What will he do? He'll send, send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and he shall gather them his, together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. Say, is that, in Revelation, is that in Revelation 2? Well, part of it is, and that's actually verse, chapter 7 is all about it. But let's, let's look at it here. Revela- it's Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And, when I, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and here we are. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars from heaven does that fall from, sound from here. It's exactly what Jesus talked about. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her in timely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. The heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the captains, the mighty men, every bondman, and every free man hid him themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the Lamb, from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, which is now beginning to fall. Now that that I mention because because it's it's the whole context of the, of the seven years and what's going on. Who's Antichrist fighting? Why is he doing it? We'll pick up there next week. Always be thankful for whatever comes. Well, it's been two weeks since we were here because we had missions conference last week. Uh, we had just finished up with this slide. And what we had done here, I'll remind you, I had showed you the... Str- what? Coffee will be delivered to you if you raise your hand. Did you raise your hand, Nancy? No, I was doing this thing. Well, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you don't get deliveries. May I continue, Beth? Okay. What we were showing here, what? Okay, thank you, John. <laughs> what we were doing here is we were showing you there's a strict correspondence between Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, and Revelation chapter 6, the six seals that are opened on the scroll. A strict correspondence. A lot of people don't like that. Don't like that at all. Uh, those that do like it are we're in good company with John MacArthur and a couple others, but I'll say most premillennial, most pre-tribulationists don't like it because it shows a, a correspondence that's uncomfortable for them. I think you can reconcile all that. MacArthur does, but uh, it's pretty interesting. But what it was in Matthew 24, verse 5, false Christs were prophesied. In, Matthew, in Revelation 6, verse, verse 2, the first seal, here comes Antichrist riding out on his white horse, the false Messiah. Matthew 24 and verse 7, wars and rumors of wars. Revelation 6, I'm doing this wrong. Revelation 6, uh, the second seal, verse 3, the red horse of war comes out. Matthew 24, verse 6, 
famine and economy problems. In, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 5, the third seal, the black horse, the black horse, and the scales, you know, a measure of wheat for a barley, uh, for a penny, and, and, and so forth. And her, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine, for the people live still living in luxury. Matthew 24, verse 21, tribulation and death. And then in chapter chapter six and verse seven of Revelation, the pale horse, the seven, the fourth seal, uh, the pale horse of death, where death and hell followed him. Uh, in Matthew twenty four verse twenty two, the elect are in view, and the, the elect are are, are 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 taken taken from the world. Uh, in Matthew, Revelation six verse nine, the slain martyrs uh, for Jesus Christ, those that came out, of, those that are part of the great tribulation. In Matthew 24, the celestial signs, verse 29, sun, moon, and stars go dark. And in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, the sixth seal, the sun, moon, and stars go dark. So this is a very strict correlation between the two. And it's very, (laughs) that ought to be encouraging to us because it shows the consistency of the Word of God. Everything keeps fitting together. The more you get into the Word of God, the more the more these puzzle pieces come together, and the less mystery there is all about about all of this. So we'll go from there. We'll go from there, and we'll pick up with our next slide here. Whoops, I'm not even running slides here. Let me just do that from current. Sorry, I didn't realize I hadn't started that. Here we go. Jack, you remember last time you were in class, we were probably still using our overhead projector? Yeah. <laughs> this is better. So here we go. So who is Antichrist fighting now? We're talking about the wars of Antichrist. Who is he fighting? Who's he against? Who's fighting with him? Why is he fighting? What's this whole war thing all about? Which takes place for basically the first three and a half years of the seven. Uh, why is he doing it? Here we go. Matthew, uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. All of this is in Daniel 11. Verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. That would be Egypt. That would be Egypt. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. I think that's going to be Syria or and maybe maybe Turkey. Syria and probably Turkey are going to be part of that. We're speculating and saying this. Uh, Like a whirlwind. We know that historically it was Syria. Because that's where Antiochus, Epiphanes, and the Seleucid dynasty had their headquarters. But they come against him like a whirlwind. So there he's attacked from the north and he's attacked from the south with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So here comes the attack from the north, the attack from the south. So he's fighting on two fronts, and he comes in and he, and he, and he invades all the countries that are involved over the, in this, and he, and he flows right through them. He just, he just walks through them. So Daniel tells us. And he shall enter also into the glorious land that would be Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. So Antichrist, even though he's fighting on these two fronts, is victorious in all this, and he and many countries are overthrown out of the, in, during this period of time. One of the prophecies about the Lord Jesus is that he will overthrow all these nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. As if to point out to us that Antichrist is not all that he is cracked up to be. He's not really the Messiah. We've got this. But these shall escape out of his hand. Even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now that's pretty interesting. I've got a map here that I don't. I've got arrows on it. I've got this from somewhere else. Just ignore the arrows. I want you to see where these countries are. So we've got basically Israel here with the West Bank showing in purple, and here's where Ammon and Moab and Edom are. It's Edom that the hundred forty-four thousand are going to go into. This is southern Jordan today. Are going to go into during the during the second half of the of the seven years for protection, but it's this part here, Ammon, Moab, and Jordan, and Edom down here, that uh, are going to escape out of his hand. He's going to have trouble conquering them. That points up the fact that he's not all powerful, but he wants to be. He wants to come across as the Messiah, but he's going to fail in those. But people are going to forgive him, and he's just going to keep on going. Uh, for context, for today's context, here's Gaza, right? There's Gaza City and the whole Gaza Strip. Uh, people often talk about, let me make something clear. People often talk about uh, the two-state solution. Um, this is just delving into politics for just a, just a second here. The two-state solution and, and Jordan and all. 
when all these lands were divided up, I'm, make, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a case politically, not, not necessarily scripturally, although it's not unscriptural. Uh, when all these lands were divided up uh, in 1947 and 48, uh, jo Jordan was, a, was created, this whole Hashemite dynasty that they've got there. That was, that was basically going to be the Palestinian homeland, and, and it didn't work out well. Uh, then, then Gaza was given, was captured by Israel, taken back, and then given back to the Palestinians. Uh, in I think it was 2004 or 2006, there were a lot of Jewish settlers that were living in Gaza at that time. They were forcibly forced off their land and taken back into Israel. And that whole area of the Gaza Strip, just 25 miles long, five to six miles wide, in this area, was given entirely over to the Palestinians for they so they could have their their state of their own. They're a separate state. That didn't work out well either. <laughs> but it's, it's not like it's not like uh, efforts haven't been made in these areas politically. Yes, Rob. It could be that the, the result of the Psalm eighty-three war will be that those that area will be desolate. It could. And so, uh, in the middle of the tribulation, when Israel goes to Petra, well. Don't know. It, it, so it, 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 the hundred and forty-four thousand. You mean best, those? those that go, desolate, then they could go in there and hide. That's true. That's true. There's, it's it, that area is full of caves and valleys and mountains and stuff like that. Where so anyway, yeah. Just a, just a little bit of a, of a detour there. But here we are. Here's the Antichrist situation now. These escape out of his hand. Uh, doesn't seem to matter. Then in verse 42, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries. Now he's going to just assume authority and control. And the land of Egypt shall not escape. He's going to go after Egypt because Egypt was one of those that, that attacked him. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Now, those are, those are significant because it tells us in a little more detail, what's going to happen when he goes after Egypt. And by the way, historically, has the Seleucid, back in his, back when Antiochus time, right? Got the Seleucid dynasty up here in, in Damascus and Syria. There, there was this constant fighting back and forth between the north, king of the north, king of the south. The, uh, the Ptolemies in Egypt and the, and the, uh, and the Seleucids up in, up in Syria. Constant back and forth. They, they never, one never really was successful in completely conquering the other. It was just constant all the time. But now it's going to kind of come to a resolution. So it says also that, and I will explain that, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. The context of this is the acquisition of all of the wealth of Egypt. He's after it. That's, and that's historically always been the case, all the wealth of Egypt. The ancient boundaries were those of countries that were used to be known as Foot and Kush. Now, usually when we talk about Kush, we're talking about I think it's Sudan. And I, well, here here's an old map. I'm, I'm I'm assuming this is accurate. I won't guarantee it because I didn't make it, which is probably good because then I know it wouldn't be accurate. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but but down here, here's Egypt. Here's Cairo. There's Egypt. Here's the Sinai Peninsula here. In this grayish area here, that would be Israel coming down in this area. But then down here, here's Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea. Um, uh, I forget how to pronounce this one. I can't even read it anyway. Somalia, where all the pirates come out of, right, and pick up and stop freighters and oil tankers. Uh, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, uh, Sudan, and uh, Sudan, South Sudan and Sudan. These were all called Kush. And uh, to the to the west, where this old the land where it used to be called in old 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 times Foot, which was in, comprised comprised Libya, Algeria, Tunisia. I think Tunisia is spelled wrong in this map. Niger, Chad, those those countries. Uh, some of them land block companies. This is countries. This is a very poor country. I knew a missionary that that lived in in Niger. But uh, oh, here's something interesting that's not part of the Bible lesson. Tripoli. Do you ever wonder, do everybody know why in the, Marine, in the Marine anthem they sing from the halls of Mount Azuma to the shores of Tripoli? What's up with Tripoli? Anybody know? Pirates. 
Pirates, good. <laughs> whoever said, yes, whoever said, yeah, pirates, okay. That was Michael. Yeah, back, I think it was during Thomas Jefferson's uh, tenure as president, they went after the, the Barbary pi- pirates, and they came, they were working out of Tripoli. And so the Marines uh, fought against the Barbary pirates that came out of Tripoli. And that's why that's part of the Marine song. Interesting. Halsa Montezuma would be what country? Mexico. Mexico, yeah, so talking about the Mexican War, too. Just interesting stuff. Not part of the lesson, although I made it then. <laughs> Sorry. Daniel eleven forty four. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to make away many. Now let's think about this. We don't know what the tidings out of the north are, but we know that Antichrist doesn't like it because he, as a result of what happens there, he's taken over Egypt, he's really concentrated everything on, on robbing Egypt of everything that is Egyptian, right? And the Lib- Libyans and Yothians, Opians just falling into line at this point. But now something's happening in the north again, and he doesn't like it. Tidings out of the east and out of the north. Out of the east and out of the north. I'm sorry. I, I can't... <laughs> My left and right are always going to be different than yours, and, I, and I'll never get them straight. So he goes out and to destroy and to kill. It says he goes forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make many away. This is an interesting thing. For those that think that the entire seven-year period is the time of Jacob's trouble or the wrath of God, this kind of makes it make, doesn't make sense in, in that context. I don't think it. I don't think that either is true. But the, if you did think those were true, this wouldn't make sense in that context because we don't see Antichrist going after Jews. We see him going after Gentiles. He's going after Syrians, Turks, Libyans, Ethiopians, uh, Egyptians. He's going after all of them. But the Jews are pretty well protected by him. That doesn't look like the time of Jacob's trouble. That doesn't look like tribulation for Jewish people. It's an interesting thing. It's something to think about. So he gets these tidings out of the north. And these describe his wars then for the first three and a half years. He's gone against these three kings. He's subdued them. The other ten now have fallen into line. And he's basically in control of at least... At least that, that part of the world that comprises control over the Mediterranean and specifically the Middle East part that we know today as, as the land of Israel and the greater old Roman Pal- uh, province of Palestina, right? So he's got all that control now. Those are his wars. Now he's going to consolidate everything and he's going to become the Jewish Messiah. The first half of the 70th week described his war against the three kings. And uh, after their defeat and humiliation, the other nations all fall into line. He's, he's victorious. Next, we're going to look at Antichrist headquarters and the death of Antichrist. So let me switch slides here. <laughs> <laughs>